Thank you. Thank you. So, as uh, Dr. Glass mentioned, my name's Alex, um, and I've been working on this project with Dr. Bondar for a little under a year now, and i uh, just like to share with you um, what we've been working on so far. So first, I'd like to distinguish between potential and entropic forces in general. Um, I'd like to discuss Eric Berlin's, uh, uh, Eric Berlin's um, one of his motivating arguments for entropic gravity. I'd like to bring up a very strong critique of entropic gravity that we then would like to address by modeling entropic gravity near Earth's surface in the context of open quantum systems, um, and then compare our results to um, those of ultra-cold neutron experiments. So traditionally, we think of gravity as a potential force. Um, so a potential force <coughs> is one dictated by a potential energy. In particular, the force is given by minus the gradient of the Potential forces are by their nature reciprocal, so every action has an equal and opposite reaction. They're path independent and they're also additive. Now, in order to help, in, in order to try to find a theory of gravity that perhaps fits into the standard model or can explain things like uh, dark matter, there have been uh, new theories of gravity that have been proposed that pick up fundamental assumptions. One of which is a theory of entropic gravity. So an entropic force is a certain type of dissipated force, by comparison, uh, which is emergent as a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. So an entropic force is given by this equation here, where we have a temperature times the gradient of the entropy. Um, now, entropic forces are, by their very nature, non-reciprocal. They're path dependent and are not additive. So a great example of an entropic force is that of a rubber band. So a rubber band itself is made of polymers that when unstretched are in a, you could say, maximally jumbled state. And this corresponds to a state of high entropy. Now, when you stretch this rubber band out, the polymers themselves become more lined up with each other and there are fewer states available uh, thus decreasing the entropy. Now, if you have a stretched rubber band in an isolated environment, then it requires no work or energy to, for it to return back to its unstretched state. And this is characteristic of entropic forces uh, overall. So this guy, Eric Verlind, proposed in 2011 that perhaps gravity could be an entropic force. Now, one of his motivating arguments for this takes insights from black hole entropy. So, uh, David or uh, yeah, Jacob Beckenstein here argues that let's say we have an object of mass m that is <coughs> comes near a black hole, and he argues that when this object comes within one Compton wavelength delta x here of that black hole that it is effectively absorbed. Now, before this object <coughs> is absorbed in the black hole, we can for sure say that, or that we can for sure say that it exists. However, once it enters the black hole, you're meaning you mean the event horizon? The event horizon, yeah. Um, however, once it enters the black hole, we can't say whether it exists or not. Um, so we've effectively gone from one state to two in this razor's edge argument which corresponds to a uh, constant change in entropy, so delta S here. Um, and here we include, we have a factor of two pi, um, which comes up later. So then we, uh, we can also consider that this object going into the black hole, crossing the event horizon, has some acceleration. And according to the UNRWA formula, we have an associated temperature that this object feels when it is accelerated. Um, so overall, we have a relationship. We have relationships for entropy, um, this position, and temperature, which 
he effectively fits into the entropic force equation here and arrives at the familiar force equation f equals ma. Um, now this is just a motivating argument and he has other arguments as well, but this at least gives some kind of insight into what he's working at. So almost immediately after he came out with this argument, there was a counter argument saying no, gravity is not an entropic force. Um, and the major criticism here is that entropic gravity would destroy quantum coherence. So the argument goes, we don't see any Brownian motion for objects that reside inside a gravitational field. Um, so what that means is that if entropic gravity is true, that, uh, that small objects must be strongly coupled to this environment. Now, strong coupling, it's believed, causes decoherence and wave function collapse, uh, which we do not observe in cold neutron or cold atom experiments. And so on purely physical grounds, some have argued that entropic gravity just cannot be true. Now, for our project, we've taken this criticism very seriously. Um, and we've said, wait, let's see if we can actually make a model of entropic gravity and acting near its Earth's surface and see what happens. Um, so using insights from quantum reservoir engineering, we hope to describe entropic gravity in the context of open quantum systems. Um, so what is quantum reservoir engineering? Uh, in general, the results um, listed in this paper here of quantum reservoir engineering are that we can, in the language of open quantum systems, we can create almost any dynamics we want for a quantum system by coupling it to environments. So in our situation, we can employ this to say, well, what if we treat gravity as just such an environment? <coughs> um, that is, we treat gravity near Earth's surface as an environment in an open quantum system with its usual dynamics. What do we get? Well, for our analysis, we have two cases here, coherent evolution, which we describe in terms of uh, the Lindblad master equation, and also in entropic evolution, which we describe also in, uh, in terms of the Lindblad master equation. And S is entropy in the entropic case? No, S is actually a free parameter. Okay. Um, S is not entropy. So in the coherent case, we have our kinetic term, p squared over 2m. We have our potential term, mgx. And this fits inside the commutator um, and is commuted with rho to get our dynamics. Now in the entropic case, we have the kinetic term here and no potential term. And in fact, we absorb it in this dissipative term, d. Um, now, what's unique about this dissipative term? Well, most strikingly, we have this free parameter, s. And with this parameter S, we can effectively control how much decoherence takes place in our model. Um, and then also X naught here is a, just a scaling factor. Uh, I'm sorry, if I may ask a question. Is the free param parameter here like a temperature if you were to take an analogy with another kind of a, like a reservoir? Uh, so, the, so our free parameter here is just a, it's a real valued uh, unitless parameter, um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it necessarily corresponds with uh, temperature directly. But it, but it should have something to do with curvature or something like this. That's the only place gravity is coming in. Well, through S. Well, so our model is basically just this is basically just modeling uh, gravity near Earth's surface. So not accounting for like general relativity or. Uh, oh, so but the only place. I see little g, that's it, and then something in S. So little g is the, what is the? The gravitational acceleration oh, okay. near <laughs> Earth's surface. Oh, okay. sorry. <laughs> it's very close to the surface, fine. Yeah. And then S? S is our free parameter. Okay, I understand. What, what is that model physically? Your, this is physics talk. So, so the thing is, both of these models satisfy the air and fest relationships I that see. are characteristic of uh, gravity that we know. So, the independent time of the value of s. No. 
Hmm? Ir regardless of. Really? Yeah, independent of s, because it's we're dealing with averages, right? I understand. So we're saying that the average dynamics overall satisfy mm -hmm. these Ehrenfest theorems, okay. characteristic of gravity as we know it. So we have the time rate of change of the position gives us um, one over the momentum, and the time rate of change of the momentum gives us minus mg. And this, this x naught is just some characteristic length scale? Yeah, yeah, it's just a scaling parameter. So x naught is just h bar squared over 2 m squared oh, g. Oh, I see it, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any, anything else? Okay. So when we take the, as the asymptotic expansion at, so the limit as s becomes very large, what we effectively do is we're able to move mgx back inside the commutator here, and it and uh, at least in this expansion it mimics that potential. And then we get this other term and other and this other term and higher order ones all proportional to one over s or greater. Um, so what that means is the larger we make s, the closer we mimic coherent evolution. Now, digging a little deeper, when we perform the purity analysis, analysis, so purity is just trace of rho squared, if we take the time rate of change of that, what we've shown is that this is, in fact, a monotonically <coughs> decreasing function of time. Um, and furthermore, when we plug in the asymptotic expansion, we get that it is a function proportional to one over s. So again, as s approaches infinity, our purity rate of change approaches zero, and we effectively can maintain coherence for as long as we want. Um, so entropic gravity can, inserve, can, can uh, preserve quantum coherence, but how does it hold up to experiments? It would be a follow-up. So what we do is we compare our results, our theoretical results, to the experimental results from this paper here, where Ravy oscillations are induced um, for neutrons residing in uh, gravitational quantum states. So the setup for this experiment are, is that in region one here, I'm not sure if that's very visible. Um, in region one, we have ultra-cold neutrons, so existing in the first, in the ground state and first few excited states um, in the gravitational field. Whoa, 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 okay. So you have a reactor spewing out neutrons. Yeah. Okay, what do you mean by the first and second excited state of the neutron? So, um, so when you calculate the energy eigenstates for an object of mass m residing in this uh, gravitational potential, yes, right, Assu free if you assume the potential model. In then free fall? In free fall, yeah. Um, then you get then you get uh, energy eigenstates from that, and so they're cooled down to the ground state, um, something like which is equivalent of like 1.4 uh, pico electron volts, and then several higher energy states. But if it's in free fall, why are there the energy levels quantized? Is that like this quantum bouncing ball is like with Airy function. Yeah, it, yeah, that's exactly it. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. It's in Sakurai's book on quantum mechanics. <laughs> Thank you. I have yeah. a whole paper on the airy function. <laughs> okay, so it's it's this airy function. Level. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Sakurai got it from my paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have these cold neutrons, these ultra cold neutrons that enter in region one here, and then in region two they undergo Rabi oscillations. So where is this reactor? Uh, it's not pictured here, but... Like, where on Earth is it? Oh, uh, Germany. Germany or Austria? Mm. <laughs> not a I, question. I, I, but I did it for the big <laughs> neutron interferometry <laughs> facility is in Austria, but I, I wasn't sure it didn't or, or the, Well, the guy that does these experiments um, oh, yeah. is uh, from Germany, but maybe I'm... Maybe Never I'm drop sick. your cell phone into the nuclear reactor in Austria, I'm just saying. <laughs> Good advice. Um, so, these neutrons then pass through this, this area here where we have a boundary that can oscillate up and down with variable oscillation strength 
in millimeters per second and oscillation frequency in hertz. Um, so then after you know, evolving through region two, it passed into region one and we effectively measure or count which neutrons are in the ground state by the end of this uh, evolution. So we'd like to see, can we model, can our model get the results of this experiment? So in order to take our results already mentioned and match these, we need to account for two things. Um, one, our neutrons have to bounce off of the boundary, and two, we have to make the boundary oscillate. Because this is what, where the question of the area functions come in. Right. You have to have a boundary in addition to the gravitational potential to get the area function. Right. Otherwise, it's a continuous eigenvalue not quanta. That was okay. So there is yeah. a boundary. It's, hit, they, not, it's bouncing off something. Yes, definitely. Right. Um, and so, in our model, so we include this boundary condition here, and what we want to do is try to see if it can enter into the air dust relationship. Um, and what we find is that, in fact, it does. Um, so when we, when we have this Hamiltonian here with the wave function psi, or um, the Ket psi, um, and we calculate the um, time rate of change expectation value of momentum, then we get the usual minus gradient of potential <coughs> in addition to this extra term, which here we have h bar squared over 2m, and then we have uh, the derivative of the, uh, of the wave function evaluated at x equals 0, and then its complex conjugate here. Um, but we can recast this in terms of the second derivative of the Dirac delta function, where we define that here. Um, and this is really helpful for our analysis because then we can effectively treat this as an instantaneous force um, and include it in our air and test theorems. Um, so, for uh, so to make to, to add bouncing to our model in the coherent case, again we have the kinetic term, potential term, and we just include this extra part, treating it as a um, instantaneous potential that the, that the neutrons experience. Um, and then in the entropic case, we have the kinetic term, we have and no potential term, and we add the same boundary. Then, and then um, the dissipator, D here, is not affected by this at all. Um, yeah, so then the next step is to just say, okay, we have a boundary included in our dynamics. Let's just make it oscillate. So we effectively just do that by just adding this minus A, the amplitude of oscillation, sine omega T, omega being the frequency of the oscillation, and T being time. Um, and, oh, this is, I'm Are sorry, this is messed up. This is, I'm button. sorry, this is a, this is a, a mistake. This is from, yeah, this is, a, this is actually what happens when you change the reference frame to that of the boundary. But, um, yeah. But the the boundary is like some silicon or germanium surface or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Some, Are you going to make that very, wiggle? Huh? How are you going to make it wiggle? Um, well, they, from my understanding, they have it uh, separated here. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I, and then I guess they, they make induce it. Yeah, they induce the oscillation. So I get, oh, whoops. So I, I apologize, this is, this is not what I was trying to get, but ultimately what, we, what we're supposed to get for the entropic case is we just add this uh, oscillating barrier into the commutator and the dissipator is invariant under the change of variables um, that we add. So, now that we've now that we've developed a sufficient model to describe what's going on in this experiment, let's see what happens. Um, so we have two free parameters in this experiment. One is oscillation strength, as I said, and the other is um, 
is frequency. So first, taking a look at frequency, we have our measured data points here, the red dots, and then the red line here is the coherent evolution, which we listed in uh, the, pr the previous slide and for the coherent case. And then um, in green, orange, and blue, we simulate our entropic model with different S values. So green is S is equal to 1,000, <coughs> orange is S equals 500, and blue is S equals 100. Um, so what we see is that um, as, as we showed analytically, the closer, the higher we make S, the closer it matches the coherent evolution, which is good. Um, and furthermore, when we compare our entropic models to the data listed, uh, we see that S is equal to 100 seems too low of a value, um, like too, there's too much decoherence taking place, and so we would say that it would probably have to be some higher S value if entropic gravity is to be true in this case. Um, increasing S means it has less effect, right? Yeah, so Sorry. increasing S means that there's less decoherence. Okay, okay. So, yeah, and then, and so we see that there are these dips here, and these correspond to uh, driving it, driving the, the Rabi oscillations at resonance. So this first one it corresponds to driving from the ground state to the second excited state, and the second dip here corresponds to driving from the ground state to the third excited state. And so let's see what happens when we fix the oscillation strength, um, or I'm sorry, fix the frequency at the uh, first transition, omega zero two, I call it, um, and then vary the oscillation strength. Um, so as we can see, again, um, the closer, the higher we raise s, the closer we get to the coherent case. Um, and also, other than this extraneous data point, we seem to have a pretty good fit for s it equals five hundred or greater. Qualitatively speaking, um, and then if we do the same thing for the second uh, for the second oscillation, where um, it's omega zero three, so transition from the ground state to the third excited state. Um, again, we see s equals one hundred falls out, but um, we see that s equals five hundred seems like a pretty reasonable lower bound on this s. And again, we, we get that the higher we raise S, the closer we get to coherent evolution. Um, so overall, what have we seen? Um, we've shown that entropic gravity can both maintain the strong coupling uh, and also minimal decoherence. Um, and we can make S as large as we want in order to mimic conservative gravity as much as we'd like. Furthermore, um, qualitatively, our models seem to match results from these ultra-cold neutron experiments, and, and we would probably estimate that S is, has a lower bound of about 500, although we need to conduct some chi-squared analysis and see what perhaps an optimal S value would be. Um, looking forward, we'd probably like to expand this model to gravity beyond Earth's surface, um, and also try to uh, simulate results from more, uh, more precise cold neutron experiments, such as like uh, Ramsey spectroscopy. So thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, Is there a value of S that corresponds to Verlinde's theory? Um, so Verlinde himself has not proposed any uh, full quantum mechanical uh, model of entropic gravity. Um, a lot of, yeah, so no, not yet. Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I have a follow-up question. Can you go back to the slide where you were showing the dynamical equations? Um, yeah. This Four. is good, yeah. So I'm trying to understand where the D hat comes from. This is where you're saying you're modeling gravity as an environment, and is that, is that that's right, right? 
Uh, yeah, more, yeah. And um, why does this particular form emerge as the choice for the dissipated dynamics? I mean, I understand the coherent case, it's just the mm -hmm. usual kind of thing. So, so um, when you plug it into the error test there, it was reproduced the same one as the coherent case. So it kind of fixes what the dissipated is. This is a unique choice. Uh, I think so. Oh, I mean, like. So, so it's not necessarily unique. Um, so let me go back to Is like the first slide. S or like so, so this doesn't necessarily have to be unique. So um, in quantum reservoir engineering, you can effectively add as many environments <coughs> as you want. And we could have modeled, um, we could have modeled gravity as being like some, many, many, many environments. This is simply, this is just the simplest case where we just have um, a single environment, a single dissipated term that works into it. Why, why exactly do you call it uh, entropic gravity? It seems like uh, some kind of environment gravity, or I, I don't know. Uh, so, so we haven't, so. It's just because like dissipated? Yeah, so basically like gravity, gravity would be a dissipative force itself, but I mean this is more just working with like, without having a overall Without having a broad-reaching uh, theory of entropic gravity, you know, can we address this criticism itself um, by saying if we look at gravity just at Earth's surface without saying like this is how the entropy is related and all of this, like, can, does this criticism hold water on physical grounds? Um, and we say no, it doesn't, um, based on these results. Thanks. Will it what temperature is this being carried out at the experiment? Did it come? Um. I, I'm pretty sure, so the neutrons are at the scale of like pico electron volts themselves, okay. like in terms of energy levels, so I, I not, I think it's around that, uh, that level. Of like how are they interacting, I guess, with the mirror is my question, like say if you're using something else like, like, like how would that change the, the how, how does the boundary change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that this this boundary itself was selected experimentally, okay. um, so that there's you know, it's a it's a um, perfectly elastic collision or a, as close as we can get. Sure. But that's that's all that I know. You might want to check out the book by Gregory Wolovic, the University Healing Process. It might it might be exciting. Okay. So um, I mean, the so the general uh, equation for gravity is not you know uh, f equals minus mg. It's f equals. Well, over, so you have to change the scale of the, the, your quantum experiment, right? So it has to be like a large scale quantum experiment to deviate from that principle that you're using. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. So I mean, like, I I guess I guess for modeling purposes, it's like when we have the minus mg, um, then that itself is like translationally invariant. So one obstacle for like modeling things beyond Earth's surface is that we no longer have that translation invariance. Um, it matters like where you're located as to what free fall looks like. So I, I, I guess, does that, does that answer your question? Well, so, <coughs> I mean, so deviation, so the mg is, mg times x is just uh, the first experience term in the expansion, right? right. So yeah. in my view, you would have to have either really precise quantum experiments or looking at it over a very large scale so where you get noticeable changes or deviations from this mg, mm. right? Or, yeah, that's. Okay. So I, I'm still flummoxed by S. Okay, so in your last slide, you say you get your data is consistent with like five, S is greater than 500. But qualitatively, yeah. Right, so, which is consistent with S is equal to infinity, which means no effect. Is that correct? Well. Your data is consistent with no effect at all. Well. Put a bound on it. Well, so. You have not seen entropic gravity in this experiment. So, essentially we're saying like, so if we take S to be infinity, 
we can mimic coherent evolution as close as, as closely as we'd like. Um, but if but if there is say so let's say you know we exhibit some experimental error. Um, well, it could be that part of it, if entropic gravity were to be true, let's say some of that experimental error is actually related to you know slight variations from the bath itself, like the. Well, when I think, I think in terms so, of the bath is greater than 500, it's consistent with no effect. Correct. In, in this model, yeah. So okay, I'm just, I'm just saying. So you have not shown any sign of entropic gravity in this experiment. Yeah. No, put a bound. Right, but so all we're saying overall is that we can't rule out entropic gravity on the grounds that it destroys decoherence, because this, in fact, is a model where decoherence, where coherence is preserved. And, and so, what is the role of mass? Let's go back to the equation, because it. The puzzling thing is whenever you have something that looks like e to the i over e to the i times, okay, down there, e to the i x hat over x naught, and s is getting very large, so the x exponential is going to zero, but it's actually in the complex plane, so it can go to zero on many different contours, and so that's all really weird, okay? And, and, but mass out front, so if mass was bigger, does this work better? So, so yeah, so if the ma if the mass is larger, the thing is, if we take the, um, I'm pretty sure when we take the asymptotic. Yeah, S has to be larger, I think, right? Huh? S has to be larger if mass gets uh, bigger. To so if I gave you a neutron that weighed several hundred times more than a neutron, this would, you could see the, you could rule it out at a better, Level, you think? Um, well, I think that I think that we're I think that it's actually related to being lighter. Um, so lighter is. I'm just asking. If I want to redo the experiment with a different particle, an electron would be better, or a uranium atom would be better. Um, hmm. Well, I don't know. They've done these experiments in France where they drop ultra cold atoms from a magneto optical trap onto an evanescent lightener, and they see the same airy functions can excite. So, but the mass is that of an atom instead of a neutron, so it's like, you know, I don't know, cesium, how many neutrons in cesium? We're gonna have to end it on that question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Very good, Ryan.